the central plank of that was not the age ban, it was they were going to ban the independent retail of tobacco. They were going to set up a national state monopoly that was the only place that could sell cigarettes, and that's how they were going to control the trade. New Zealand is also an island in the middle of nowhere, actually quite hard to smuggle things into. Neither of these things are true of Britain. So what we have here instead is the most eye-catching but least practical bit of the New Zealand proposals, with nothing else. There's no enforcement, it's being left to trading standards, which is already overstretched. And so what you will get as a practical result of this policy over the next five years is you will get essentially random punishment beatings for independent retailers who get caught out by trading standards on a fairly arbitrary basis. And then a future government is going to have to make the big decision which Rishi Sunak ducked, which is thousands, maybe tens of thousands of small shops are dependent on tobacco revenue to stay afloat. If you stop them selling cigarettes, then they will go under. If you don't stop them selling cigarettes, this policy is going to leak like a sieve. Mm. One in five cigarette sales in this country are already via the black market. The interception rate for uh, containers, smuggled containers at British ports, is I think one in ten. So one of those two things will happen. A future government, not this one, is going to have to decide whether to repeal this policy, or at least se severely amend it, or actually try and enforce it and take the political cost of sinking all those retailers. While Rishi Sunak gets to walk away a bit like George Osborne with the sugar tax and say, oh, what's the one thing I'm proud of when I did as Prime Minister? Well, I am proud to be the Prime Minister who finally banned smoking, while poor Labour ministers presumably uh, get torn apart by the Federation of Small Businesses as corner shop after corner shop after corner shop goes under. That's a pretty convincing argument, Angela, isn't it? Uh, well, if there is a future Labour government, um, poor ministers, they voted for it. They whipped... Um, their members to go through the lobby, whereas it was a free vote for us. And interestingly enough, um, back in 2006, I think a lot of people forget that Labour gave a free vote and many Labour cabinet members actually did vote against um, the banning of smoking indoors. Um, John Prescott back, being one of them. Yeah. Um, so I think what's interesting is where is the public on this? Because um, I think it's about 70% of the public are in favour of um, having a smoke-free generation when they look at the policy. 70% of the public are in favour of hanging. 33% of the public backed shooting protesters on the streets in, in, in 2011. And I mean, surely politicians are supposed to lead public opinion. Yeah, but I mean, well, the thing is, I have quite a clear view um, that as an MP, I'm a representative, not a delegate. And when it's a free vote and a conscience vote, um, I definitely do not delegate that out to my constituents at all. I feel that, that I've been selected and elected in order to um, use my experience and to interrogate things. Um, but what's interesting is I think I had about 25 emails and 80% of them were in favour and 20% uh, were against and that was the extent of the engagement uh, from my constituents so far on it. It will be interesting um, having had the vote now to see whether uh, people start making comments on it. Um, but I think we have to look at the cost because I think as politicians we're always um, looking at how much things cost and the cost to the taxpayer of smoking is £17 billion and all we get in in terms of tax revenue is £10 billion. Pounds. Um, from smoking. So I think we have to put those things but into balance as well. how do you counter the well. arguments that Henry put forward? Well, Henry was um, quite focused on how do you enforce it. Um, the government has said there'll be £100 on the spot fines um, for retailers who sell um, uh, things legally. Um, but we're putting £30 million a year every year into enforcement on it. So there is new money going into um, helping to enforce it. There's something it. psychological, though, isn't there, about the prohibi prohibited drug or... Um, I mean, I look back to myself and I smoked when I wasn't allowed to smoke. I smoked age 14, age 15 at boarding school. It was the most exciting thing you could do. It was the interface between you and a potential boyfriend. It was a chance to, you know, go down the drain pipe and do something you shouldn't. As soon as I was out on my own and allowed to smoke, I was lucky enough to just be able to toss it off because, frankly, what was the fun if it wasn't going to make me brush with mm. some set of rules? And I do worry, but you laugh at me, Ian. But no, no, I'm, just, I'm just imagining you at boarding school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was suspended and then I was... Event yes, we won't go down that route, OK? I'd already been disposed, dispatched from my state school. Um, so th the point being is, I think it, it it makes it weirdly more attractive when at the moment the direction of travel among the younger generations is to give up or not even begin with tobacco. Vaping's a different problem. Mm. I concur with Claire here mm. that this is a, a new generation who don't touch tobacco start up with the vaping. That's a separate issue, much harder to catch, by the way, because I can shimmy down the drain pipe and you can't smell it on me. But it's it's 
I think the, the wrong place to start. If Rishi Sunak's telling me as a teenager not to do something, I think it makes me want to do it. Where are my silky slots? Also the, they, were the, they were the brand in my sorry? Silk cuts, silky slots. The other, the other quick thing about this is you say that things are going the right way. It's actually interesting. Downing Street sort of had to cook the books on this to make a case for this policy because the Khan review, the government's big review that it, it commissioned a couple of years ago, its projection was that with no further interventions, the prevalence of smoking by mm. 2050 would fall to 2%. Exactly. Uh, Belgian government, 2%. New Zealand government, 2%. I think cancer research, 2%. The government published this thing that said actually without this policy, this very badly designed policy that won't work, it would actually stay at 8%. And they said this is in line with other studies. I can't find them. They don't acknowledge the existence of the Khan Review. They don't say they don't say how why the Khan Review was wrong. But what that does is it inflates the purported impact of this policy by 400%. Um, it's just absurd from start to finish. Like normally, like I, don't get me wrong, I'm fairly libertarian. A lot of public health policy is quite badly designed. But like there's normally they put the effort in. To kind of laundering the case and then constructing it. Can you Whereas see this why? has just been cooked up to I'm, a conference speech. I, I, I feel like I'm in a sort of weird political no man's land when I agree with Henry Hill from Conservative Home. You know, I'm like, oh, what has gone wrong? But th there are key issues here. Why is this when we've got uh, obesity rates that are okay. rising? No, you made, you've made, you've yeah, made know, that point. Yeah, well, why are we I'm, I'm just concentrating in my mind on silky sluts. Yeah. It's 8:32. Uh, did you smoke? I didn't. Well, I didn't smoke at school. You see, I only smoked when I went to live in Germany because everyone else did and I felt left out. Well, you're not the lassie boy in the Marlboros. I see No, the I, 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 I got a packet of camel cigarettes oh. and smoked a lot of them, one after the other, and thought, why do people do this? It's disgusting. Sobrani Black. And I've never... The only time I've ever smoked since then is if I've been drunk and seeing as I don't drink, that doesn't happen very often. Okay. Right, we have to go <laughs> the to the news on. headlines at 8.32 with Daryl Jackson. <clears throat> Rishi Sunak's plans to ban people born after 2009 from ever buying cigarettes have passed their first test in the Commons. MPs voted in favour of the bill, which also includes a crackdown on young people vaping. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak's spoken with his Israeli counterpart following the weekend's attack by Iran, urging him it's the moment for calm heads to prevail. Downing Street's as Benjamin Netanyahu thanked the Prime Minister for the UK's help shooting down missiles. And Dubai has been hit by major flooding after a year's rainfall in a day. It's left roads underwater while the world's busiest airports had to divert flights. LBC weather cold and dry tonight in most places, but showers will return to Scotland and Wales in a low of two degrees. This is LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.36 on LBC. We have Conservative MP Angela Richardson with us. She's Deputy Chairman of the party. Dr Tessa Dunlop, historian, author and broadcaster. Claire Hanna, SDLP MP for Belfast South. And Henry Hill, acting editor of Conservative Home. Um, so I think it's Sal. Uh, my sight isn't very good today because I've had an injection in one of my eyes, so forgive me if I stumble over this. Ian, do you select your cross-question lady participants based on their attractiveness as well as their ability? It certainly appears so today. Sorry, Henry. I was going to say, ouch. <laughs> yeah, right. Is that a positive? Is that a compliment I think that's a compliment. Not? I think take it, Tessa. Okay, I'm owning it. Right, let's go Smoking to that one. Richard in Walton-on-Thames. Hello, Richard. Well, no, it's a text question. Uh, do you... <laughs> I'm doing so well tonight. Do you agree that praying at school is against British values, as suggested by Suella Braverman today, when she wasn't being hauled out of a conference in Brussels? And if so, which British value does it contravene? Now, Suella Braverman was actually a co-founder of the Michaela Community School. Um, she said today, if someone can scroll the screen up for me, oh, apparently I can scroll, who knew? Mm. Oh, yes, I can. There we are. Um, she's a co-founder of the Michaela Community School. She said today, a school should be free to do what is right for the pupils it serves. The court's decision is therefore a victory for all schools. Schools should not be forced by one child and her mother to change its approach simply because they've decided they don't like something at the school. Claire Hannah. I'm a bit conflicted um, about this. Obviously, I come from, from Northern Ireland where we have a big discussion about integration and sharing in schools because it, it's traditionally a fairly divided um, society and I have some sympathy um, from those who say, look, look, let's just get all religion out of the uh, religious. Um, but I can't see this outside of the context of, of, I think, how a lot of Muslims are feeling about um, maybe the perception being given that they are instinctively different or dangerous or damaging. And I'm pretty sure um, the commentary about it today wouldn't have been the same if a child had a challenged about, you know, being able to say a decade of the rosary or the Lord's Prayer. I, I, I don't think the same um, commentary would be the case. So I think if you are responding to it in the same way as you would do if it was a Christian child um, saying Christian prayer, then that's um, fair enough. Um, but I, I think, yeah, difference is the essence of humanity. People have um, different practices. But I thought, I must say, her, it wasn't, it was voiced up, but, well, I don't think it was the child herself, but I listened to her statement mm -hmm. afterwards and I thought it had great dignity in it. She was saying that she was pleased that she had taken the challenge, that she accepted the finding of the court, but that, she was, pounds to the uh, but that she was staying true to her beliefs. I don't know, I haven't read the judgments, so I don't know how invasive um, uh, it, it, it was, but if it's a case of a child wanting to pray for five minutes at their lunchtime, um, I can understand that being facilitated. I think there is a wider conversation. Well, I think the about point that the judge, the judge made was the fact that. Uh, the parents knew what the school's policy was before they sent the child to the school. And well, I think that's probably in, quite in, a crucial in, in, issue. In some cases, and as I say, um, we're, we're really having this debate in Northern Ireland about are people choosing um, a school for its faith ethos or lack of ethos, or are they choosing it because it's five minutes walk away, it's got a breakfast club, it's got good academics or whatever. And I think people, and in fact, I've I've been approached at this topic um, from the reverse direction, people who have gone to a faith school and then are, um, you know, keen that their children isn't exposed um, to religion, which isn't something that's available in Northern Ireland um, in, in total. So I think people choose schools for, for different reasons. My understanding is this is a retrospective ban. I don't think it was necessarily banned when the child um, approached the school. Um, so there is um, some there's a pretty nasty whiff of some fairly anti-Muslim sentiment um, in some of the commentary. Not all of it, of course. People are are, are analysing it um, on the points of law, okay. and I can understand um, their their anxiety about that. Angela, uh, so actually, the in the judgment, the judge did say um, that the student had, at the very least, impliedly accepted that she would be subject to restrictions on her ability to manifest her religion when joining the school. So it was understood at that point. It's not a faith school; it's uh, a secular school. But the question was about British values, and I don't know if anyone else on the panel has actually visited Michaela, but I have. I, in early March 2020, just before COVID um, broke out, I did go with a group of MPs to go and visit the school um, and see it and I would actually encourage everybody 
everybody. And Catherine Burble saying the head is actually very open um, to people coming along to see what she does because what they do is they've taken children from um, quite diverse backgrounds and difficult backgrounds and their results mm. are extraordinary. So in the last year, the school ranked in the the top in the country on Progress 8. And what Progress 8 does is it measures um, how a much a secondary school has helped pupils improve since a primary school. Um, I think there was quite an interesting comment from Tony Sewell. Um, he was a race star. We had him on the programme a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, uh, he said the judgment should deliver a warning to activist groups that schools will not be hounded into adjusting their policies on religious grounds. I think for we need to sort of look into a little bit more as to what actually happened, um, who was impacted, because the teaching staff were impacted by this. Um, and the judge also said um, that the prayer ban restored good relations within the school. That school is turning out exceptional young people who I hope will have a very bright future. Um, and I support the judgment that's come okay. out today. Henry? I mean, I think that the comment about British values is slightly nuts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what they are anyway, but I, as, as far as I'm Remember, some elements of a Christian assembly is still actually required in school by mm -hmm. law. Uh, it's so, a 1980s law. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 but right. So the idea that prayer in school contravenes British values, they're very new British values. It definitely contravenes French values, yeah. um, but I'm not entirely sure it contravenes British ones. On the actual policy, I think this, I think this is fine, right? The whole point of free schools and the, and the, and, and the uh, academisation agenda was that you had a diverse school system instead of just a monolithic system of, of, of local authority schools. You had a much more diverse school system that allowed different schools to do different things. And that means that you can have faith schools uh, where people's faith is reflected in all parts of the school. You can have schools that don't really care much about it either way. And you can have schools like Michaela, which do choose to go down the French sort of laissez route. And I think that's absolutely fine. And I support A, having a diverse school system, and B, those schools having quite strong institutional rights to enforce their own rules. So I think Michaela's in the right. It's not personally, I think, what my school policy would be, I, but it's not my school. And I haven't built a school that turns out such excellent results. So... I think this is good. I think that if you're going to have a school system which does allow all kinds of different schools to flourish, part of that is allowing them to be different and not sort of eventually grinding them all back in together through the courts. Tessa? The myth of choice in the English state school system. I can't talk to Northern Ireland or Scotland because I don't have first-hand experience, but I can confirm that one state school that does outstrip the Michaela Community School is Greycoat Hospital School, which is a Church of England school. I think it's in the top five state schools. It is equally strict. 400 stripped. yards from here. It is indeed. My daughter goes there and um, their assembly and Christian prayer and worship are obligatory, irrespective of whether you may be an atheist. Why I focus on the idea of choice is that as a, I suppose, nominally Christian family, although I've never ticked Christian in the census ever, and neither has my daughter, um, I can choose from almost all of the 8,000 faith schools that are available and tend to be more exceptional. If you are Muslim, you can choose from 30. Therefore, the idea that a child has a choice and is able to go to a Muslim school to exercise her or his mm. right to prayer is a misnomer. And secondly, there's no point pretending that me, if I was a fully-fledged Christian doing my bit for Protestantism, uh, I can pray very quietly because I do so many things quietly in a corner with my hands clasped together. Whereas if you are a Muslim, it requires commitment. Uh, there's an element of physicality. There's a prayer mat. And there is uh, the five times a day, including lunchtime. And it's built into what being a Muslim is all about. So let's not pretend this doesn't discriminate. It does discriminate. So if you're going to be piecemeal about what British values are, I thought British values were about not discriminating. And I do feel that she was actually playing to dog whistle politics when in her statement today, the head teacher signed off with God save the king. Now, if that hasn't got a religious aspect, or at least a divine aspect, I don't know what does. Good point. See, only, in, only in this country would someone find that weird. Or if you're in America, nobody would find it weird to say God, well, God save the president, but... Um, <laughs> he well, needs a bit of sympathy. Well, <laughs> every politician in France signs off with Vive la République, Vive la France, right? That's yeah. complete, but, it's but it's the completely point is, normal. Said God save it's yeah. well, that, because that's, what, that's the thing. There's not but an alternative. We, we are, we are normally a Christian but, country. Yeah, mm -hmm. God, but, say, God, okay, God well, save the king is pretend, literally the national anthem. But then if we're nominally a Christian country, let's not pretend that state schools are entirely secular. Because actually, all their holidays are baked around the Christian calendar. Christmas, mm. Easter, for example. I mean, did you go to church on Easter Sunday when all the children were off school? No, when I didn't. were you rolling your egg? I... Were you thinking about Jesus on a cry on a cross? No, no, but I'm actually, not religious. No, but the, but the bedrock of our education system is centered around the Christian there, faith. There is nothing to stop 
a Muslim Catherine Burble saying from starting a free school that would include uh, Muslim prayers five times a day. No, but uh, uh, granted, but that you, you and I know as well that actually m many of the most disadvantaged with which this school attracts and really helps and makes a difference to um, don't have the agency involved in establishing a free school. I wouldn't have had to go about doing that with you. Well, nor would I. And I, I, I doubt whether Catherine Burbison did when Muslim, she did either. Yeah. But again, when we're, we're talking, and again, I'm, I'm obviously coming at this from a Northern Irish perspective, and my views have evolved in general on, um, we talk about um, expressions of identity in public spaces, and I used to be like, ban them all. But you can't, mm. shared space doesn't have to be completely blank or neutral space you know it should be we want to get to a place where people can be who they are and and express aspects of their faith whether whether it's you know her religion or whether it's another this part isn't of their a, this isn't a public space schools. you can have a uniform set of rules for a public space this Again, is an institutional space and institutions should be allowed to set but, their but own I, but rules I, but i think the points around around the choice yes people can in theory go around the world and 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 find a school in all sorts of other places but people are making uh, their education choices on a wide range of issues not just about the ethos and it's up to mind. them how they prioritize then yeah, if, the they, if, if this is so if this is so objectionable they cannot send their children to Michaela exactly if they are choosing instead to yep, prioritize Michaela's choice. excellent results over over the secularism thing but, then that's on them you're they're not asking entitled them to, to do is sacrifice the altar of their Muslim, Muslim, Muslim identity yeah. on good grades so what for example, a lot of the children were doing were actually yeah. choosing to go home and complete their prayers at a different time of the day they found a way around this. The judge also in his ruling accepted the practical difficulties of allowing indoor Muslim prayer during the, the day. And I would say again, if you've visited Michaela, it's on a very, very small site. Um, and the way that the school works, um, there are limited um, practicalities for doing this. And I think, you know, it's the judge has found this. They've looked into it very carefully. And, you know, we can have the arguments over other schools, but this is Michaela okay. and this is what's happened here. We do love a guest that's prepared for the programme. And you've clearly done that, Angela. Site visit? That's a pretty good <laughs> Are you suggesting the rest of us haven't done our research, not, Ian? <laughs> I, if the cap fits, Tessa. Uh, we will move on to other subjects in just a moment. In fact, after 9.15, Dean, uh, I'm going to talk about prayer on the on the back of this as well. And my question to you is going to be, what's the point of it? It's 8.48. LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. We have Angela Richardson, Tessa Dunlop, Claire Hannah and Henry Hill answering your questions. Here's a text question from Chris in Stubbington. Belgian police, supported by the mayor of one of the parts of Brussels, closed down the National Conservatism Conference, which Nigel Farage and Suella Braverman were at today, in order to, quote, guarantee public safety. I wonder what they thought Sola Braverman was going to do. Is free speech under threat in the EU? Now, the background to this. The mayor of the district of Brussels, which includes the hotel where this conference was being held, has said the far right is not welcome. However, Belgium's Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, has called the shutting down of this conference unacceptable. Henry. I mean, in the EU is a bit sweeping. There's, there's a lot of countries in the EU and they all have very different positions on this, I think. But this is clearly an abuse of the law, I think. Um, it's, a, there is a, it's a law that is designed to ensure public safety in the event of disorder or potential disorder, the kind of thing that is used, for example, to control where football crowds can go. And what they've done is fairly explicitly just use it to target a, a, a conference of people they don't like. Uh, that's fairly cut and dried. You don't have to like the NatCon conference, I think, to think that this is quite clearly a law being used in the way that it shouldn't be. Uh, it's good that the Belgian government has, has, or the Prime Minister, has said that it's a bad thing. But as ever, with this kind of thing, the question is, OK, well, what are you going to do? You clearly have a law which gives far too much arbitrary power to officials at the wrong level. What safeguards are there going to be to make sure that doesn't happen again? Because Victor Orban, who mm -hmm. is um, perhaps not to everybody's taste, but he, he is the Prime Minister of Hungary, he's due to speak at that conference tomorrow, I think. Presumably, if they, if they let him in. Uh, apparently, this afternoon, I think they were letting people out but not letting them into the conference. It, as far as I can see, there is no there is no public safety case here. They haven't produced one. The police haven't produced some kind of threat report. So it's actually fairly cut and dry as a freedom of speech issue goes. Uh, it's, it's, it's always an interesting, this kind of case, because it's really easy to support freedom of speech when the target is nice and sympathetic and they're in some faraway country with a nasty government. Uh, but the question is whether or not you support the principle here when the target is Victor Orban, who is genuinely, you know, a very unsavoury politician. And I suppose they could have made a mistake and they, they thought it was a national socialism conference as opposed to a national conservatism conference. Uh, well, I mean, well, you would hope that people <laughs> wielding this kind of power would Google what they were targeting before they shut it but down. But th this is one of these sort of groups in Britain. I mean, the national. this is That's a sort right, of yeah. European-wide thing, I yeah. think, isn't it? But there is a group in Britain called National Conservatives. Is this the one that Danny Kruger and Miriam Cates are behind? They're an American... Uh, I believe it's mostly an American crossover group, right. so National con national Conservatism is, I think, mostly an American It's an unfortunate outfit. name, isn't they're it? They're the new yeah. Conservatives. Danny yeah, the new, the new, oh, are they? The, the new Conservatives. But Kruger spoke at the NatCon conference. So they're not the popular Conservatives. That's Liz Truss. Yes, that's correct. Irony alert. But national conservatism is more of a, is, as I understand it, national conservatism or NACON is more of a think tank. It's more of like an academic uh, sort of policy and philosophy group. Whereas the new conservatives, the popcons and so on, they're, they're political caucuses inside the Conservative Party. Um, hardly a unified party, is it, when you've got all of these different groups vying for attention? Well, it's interesting. I think it goes back to the um, the smoking bill earlier today. Um, I, I quite often like it when my colleagues agree with me um, and I quite like it when they disagree with me because it sort of helps me to see that there is such a broad coalition within the Conservative Party and it's amazing how many times I come together with my colleagues on one issue and we sort of split apart and we might be on different sides of the debate on other issues um, but there's so much that joins us together. I think you'll be, I'm not a nat con. Um, I'm not a new Conservative, even though I was newly elected in 2019. Um, but I... Are you a pop con? No, I'm not popular either. Are, are you anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a member of the One Nation caucus. Right. Um, so I think, as we were chatting earlier, because I was a Brexiteer, I think people immediately think that you're on the right of the party. Um, but my constituency would tell you everything you need to know um, about sort of where my politics sits, and it's much more in the centre ground, sort of socially liberal, fiscally conservative. Um, but, you know, I thought Nigel Farage had had enough of Brussels, um, so I'm quite quite surprised he's there. Um, but mind you, he gets all over the place these days. I think I think about this in terms of what would we do in this country? I've been sick of um, freedom of speech is issues and people no platformed um, in this country. I think um, universities, etc., we've really had to clamp down on that. And in fact, I think we passed some legislation 
education um, during this last session in Parliament, um, the um, Freedom of Speech, the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act, mm. um, just to make sure that people's views could be heard. Um, and I agree with um, Henry on this one. Um, I, I, I think there isn't, I can't see the case that they can make that this is a safety okay. issue. Claire Hannah. I can't think of any conference I'd rather attend less or any uh, gaggle of characters I'd rather listen to less, but I think this was the wrong call. The National Association of Undertakers. An immediate uh, threat to public safety, and I'd say it's all their dreams come true because Mm -hmm. um, this is a group of people who love to be the most oppressed people ever and love to be shut down by the mainstream, and they could have had their um, wee meeting and we never needed to know about it, but this has probably fuelled all of their conspiracy theories and uh, and, and fantasies. It is worth saying, and I I mean, Suella Braverman is home secretary was flat out banning things and trying to ban the hate marches as she talked about it and she was part of a government who um, uh, just bill after bill of restriction on the right to uh, protest and the mechanisms in which uh, people could protest you're saying Orban is due to speak there tomorrow not a man who's famous for offering platform and free speech to um, his political opponents. So uh, I think this um, this was a this was a bad move. I, I think I think the review their views of, of some of the speakers that I've seen listen, listed are repugnant. But I think it was the wrong call uh, to ban it. And I'm glad that they will be able to rely on their um, their their fundamental rights of expression and freedom granted to them um, under um, European Convention of Human Rights. And I'm sure they'll be delighted to leave on those. Tessa Dunlop. I mean, the lines that came out of this, it was simply monstrous, according to Nigel Farage, and somebody else called them tin pot dictators. I mean, talk about an own goal. It's quite extraordinary. I'm glad Decree was quick off the mark. You know, he was citing sort of assembly laws and the Belgium constitution. How could this possibly have happened? I mean, the big concern for me was that Nigel Farage, who's lost a lot of weight recently, wasn't going to get his lunchtime sandwich because apparently even food was difficult to smuggle in. Phew, I was very glad when I heard the update that actually sandwiches had somehow made it beyond the police barricade and that the far right are being sustained. Um, I, I mean, it's a joke. Of course, it's a joke. just so much as winks at him. He will be, like I say, the cat that got the cream. On, on that, he was actually right, though. He did have a point. He did have a point, And that's the problem, mm. because actually that gives some credibility. So going forward, you think, well, maybe there's a point here too. Let's root around. Let's find out what's going on. So Somebody's just texted, but is Nigel Farage a, a politician or a television presenter? I don't think he knows the answer to well, that. Well, I thought nowadays, moment. if you were a conservative, you had to be both, just because it's <laughs> unlikely you'll have a job come the end of this year. <laughs> well, Angela's already made a bid to take over from me on this programme, haven't you? Have I? When? <laughs> <laughs> you're doing so well tonight and you're so well prepared. We all thought you would, you know, dress running. <laughs> right, um, we are going to move on because we've got another 15 minutes with our panel and then we're going to talk about prayer because we've already talked about the um, Michaela School on the, on the programme this evening. But I want to widen the argument out out after 9.15 and I want to explore why people pray. Um, it, it may seem an obvious answer in some ways, but but it isn't, is it? I mean, it, it, prayer is common to, I think, virtually every religion and people do it, but I wonder what they think they're going to get out of it. That's what we're going to ask after 9.15. Uh, but it is now 9 o'clock on LBC. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, government plans to ban anyone born from 2009 onwards from ever buying cigarettes to pass the first hurdle in the Commons. But a swathe of Conservative MPs voted against it, including government ministers. The legislation raises the legal age for buying cigarettes every year and was backed by Labour MPs. Former Health Secretary Alan Johnson has told LBC the government does have a responsibility to intervene. The more I hear Liz Truss run against the nanny Mm. state, just to pick a name, out of the air, the more I know it's the right thing to do. Because actually state intervention is the only way we're going to turn the tide on what is now an absolute epidemic of sickness. Downing Street's described reports that Belgian police attempted to shut down a conference due to be addressed by British politicians as extremely disturbing. Authorities in Brussels ordered police to close the event, citing concerns about public safety. 
The Prime Minister has told Benjamin Netanyahu it is a moment for calm heads to prevail in Israel's response to Iran's missile and drone attack. Rishi Sunak spoken to his counterpart, who's being urged by world leaders not to retaliate. Well, meanwhile, the Israeli Defence Force is claiming it's killed a senior Hezbollah commander in an airstrike in Lebanon. A statement says Ismail Yusuf Baz has been eliminated. A Muslim pupil has lost a high court challenge against a ban on prayer rituals at her North London school. The Michaela Community School successfully defended the legal challenge after the student claimed the practice amounted to discrimination. Barry Smith is a co-founder of the school. He's told LBC it's one of the best performing in the country and that's down to discipline and slick operation. It's all about sacrifices. If you want to be part of this team, if you want to join this school, we all give and take, whether you're Hindu, you're Muslim, you're Christian, whatever you are, it sacrifices for the greater good of the whole or cohesion across the school. And it's been confirmed the Prince of Wales will return to royal duties this week following the announcement of Kate's cancer diagnosis. William will carry out his first public engagement on Thursday. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed trading down 145 points at 78.20. The pound buys $1.24 and €1.17. LBC Weather. With Ripple Energy, part owner wind farm for a greener way to power your home. Cold and dry tonight in most places, but then showers will return in parts of Scotland and also Wales. Lows tonight of two degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Daryl Jackson. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Two minutes past nine. This is an extended, well, it's sort of an extended cross question, but it will end up the same length, if you see what I mean. Angela Richardson is here, Conservative MP for Guildford, uh, Deputy Chairman of the party, which involves what, Angela? Uh, a lot of campaigning, coming and um, speaking to you on the media, um, and I think just sort of encouraging volunteers um, and activists to go out there and um, keep working hard. And, and not putting your foot in it like your predecessor kept doing. Um, well, I'm not a political traveller, um, and I think that um, I joined the Conservative Party in 2016, got made an MP in 2019. I've got the Conservative Party to thank for the fact that I'm able to do this fantastic job. Uh, Tessa Dunlop, have you got a book out soon? Not till next year, and I'm here tonight on the premise that I can plug it next year, so I'm in a future proof of life <laughs> conservative what, MP. What's it about? Um, it's about war and the commemoration of war, yeah. because it's um, it going to be 80 years um, since the end of the Second World War, and I want to look at the way in which we commemorate that war, seen as less complicated, black and white, clear-cut, the right war to win and the right war to fight, in comparison with, for instance, recent... Um, conflicts. I was up at the Commando Memorial in Spainbridge in Scotland, the very famous three commandos, you know, the, the elite that were established under Churchill. But then if you look a 360 to your rear, there's this a memorial garden full of plaques to men in Iraq, in Afghanistan, young boys, 23, 25. And I, I, I've never been to a memorial. I realised it wasn't the Scottish rain. I was I was genuinely moved to tears. Claire Hanna is here, SDLP MP for Belfast South and Henry Hill, acting editor of Conservative Home. Right, Simon's in Edgware. Simon, what would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. My question is this. In light of the increasing tensions in the Middle East, does the panel agree with me it is time now to confront Iran militarily, in particular to destroy their nuclear arsenal before it becomes weapons grade? Um, Claire. Well, look, we're in a really deeply concerning and difficult place. And I think, like many people have found Saturday night really eerie and, and, and worrying. Um, the last couple of days has seen a lack of escalation, which we should welcome. But there are political forces both in and around um, both Iran and Israel who are playing their own agendas, playing their own um, games and uh, which won't end uh, well and they have anything other than de-escalation in mind. We now have two uh, nuclear powers exchanging ballistics. That's the situation that we're in um, at, the, at the moment um, over recent uh, months and I think that's a very worrying place for us to be and I think um, it would be uh, madness to, to, to be as gung-ho as this question um, suggests. I think we need to um, get back to a cease, finding a ceasefire and a sustainable two-state solution um, in in the Middle East as a, as a, as a platform and a basis to um, try and walk a lot of this back. And, and um, I think the last thing we need is, is, is um, people going hell for leather and, and um, 
trying to get See, more weapons I, out. I, I've spoken to several Iranian <coughs> expats on the programme over the past couple of days, and with one exception, they've all said, no, the, the, the Israelis and the West in general needs to hit at Iran and hit heavily because it's the only language that that regime understands and they will exploit any sign of weakness. And they say what you, they would say that what you've just said is a sort of typical European view from people who don't understand the Middle East. I was thinking as I was walking down here, the last time I spoke to you was the 11th, the 11th of October. Um, and I talked about, we spoke about what was likely to come um, in, in, in Gaza. And we talked about how there isn't always a military solution um, to, to, to problems in the in the here and now um, and I don't I mean I'm obviously like you and others have the deepest of concerns about um, the leadership in Iran too but also in Israel who are completely and utterly out of control and acting in a way that is entirely um, beyond the pale and is injurious to um, the safety of innocent um, Israelis as, as as well as others um, in, in the region. I don't see how um, there is a quick I'm no expert in this but I don't see how there's a, 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 a quick sharp military um, uh, solution to this in, in, in a way that the, the questioner is indicating. Tessa. It's interesting, isn't it, that we talk about Iran and how they need to respond or be forced to respond to a short, sharp shock treatment from the West. Arguably, the exact same could and should be applied to Putin, but that's the big boy that we've chosen to almost wash our hands with. Look at America at the moment. I thought the most pitiful thing that I read in the newspaper was, I think, in the Metro this morning, which was like, from the Israeli defense, uh, from the um, Ukrainian defense minister, going, C -c can't you come t to our country and help us sh sh shoot down what the Russians are sending in, mm. like the way you have done for Israel? And I think it's interesting. I was just talking about commemoration and, 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 and war. And I think for a huge number of British people at the moment, and not just in Britain, but across the West, there's a feeling of conflict where we're putting huge amounts of money, actually, every time the RAF go down the Middle East, whether it's bashing at the Houthis or, or supporting Israel in the Iron Dome, it's costing millions of pounds of ex levels of expertise. When most of us, I think, feel that the, the more clear-cut and direct threat that we understand and we know needs put back in its box is in Russia, is in Europe. And... It's just extraordinary that we haven't managed to contain Israel, that there's been an escalation over the last six months, which means that all the attention, the focus, the build-up in Ukraine has just bled away. It's, we're in dire straits. And by the way, in the long term, the problem is Russia. And we've lost sight of that. Hendry? There are sensible things that we should do to try and contain Iran, mainly because, as we've seen in Yemen with the Houthis, um, Iran has proxies basically with a knife on the jugular of one of the most important lanes in all of global trade. And But there are, these are sensible interventions. You know, we have an ally in Oman. The Houthis have supply lines running through Oman. We can do interventions there. There are other sort of sort of tactical things you can do. But, but the idea of a full-on military intervention against Iran, I mean, setting aside everything else, like with what? Like, with what? Like, who's going to do it? America doesn't want to do it. America couldn't be bothered to stay in Afghanistan, and it, and, and it was sort of routed by the, by the Taliban. Uh, Iran has a proper military, and I don't think it has nuclear missiles yet, but it's it definitely has. A, it's enriching Europe, but it is not currently a nuclear, a nuclear power, but I don't think we can eventually prevent that. It will do it. But there's no one else. Whenever Western politicians, this is something that's slightly great, and it also grates about Ukraine, whenever you get Western politicians in Europe talking big about military interventions anywhere in the world, what they're always doing, essentially, is writing checks that they expect America to cash. And there's no prospect. Britain could not invade Iran if it wanted to. We don't have a single deployable division. Uh, our, our contribution to the task force in the, in the Red Sea is uh, one ship. Uh, the Anglo-American task force consists of lots of American ships and then one British ship, so we get to call it the Anglo-American task force. Like, if you want to be able to talk about intervening in these parts of the world, come back in 10 years after 10 years of sustained 4% of GDP in defence. Until then, it's, it's meaningless to talk about a military strike on Iran. Which, incidentally, is probably what we should be committing when we look at the threat that's currently posed to the safety of Europe. I, mean, I, I, agree, yeah. I, agree, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not a dove. I do think that there are curfews. Because it's very right-wing, Tessa. I'm not right-wing. Why is it right-wing <laughs> to believe in the security of Europe? I Indeed. totally agree with you. <laughs> Good. But unfortunately, there are many on the left that don't. Indeed, but I thought Keir Starmer, at least he... Yeah, you no, know, credit to him. He peed on um, the right lamppost there on the 2.5%. Well, that wasn't quite the right analogy, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Nice, nice um, change from Jeremy Corbyn's days, though. Faz says, the SDLP woman should be our next Prime Minister. I like her too. Mm, there you are. 
woman. <laughs> busy. I'm not from around here. <laughs> uh, Angela. Um, so I think to Simon, to answer Simon's question, I think we need diplomacy and de-escalation. They have to be our priorities when it comes to um, Iran. I think we also, um, you know, need to look at their proxies, um, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hamas in Palestine. And really, our focus should be back on what's happening in Gaza, um, making sure we can get. Um, that immediate humanitarian pause, keep getting the aid in and get Israel working with its Arab allies as it was doing before the events of October the 7th to sort of um, uh, work towards that two-state solution, which I think we're probably all in agreement that that's where we need to get to. Can, can I ask Andrew a really quick question? Very quickly, because we want to move on. How do you feel about your Prime Minister continuing to sell arms to Israel at the moment? Um, my understanding is that our country supplies 0.2%. It doesn't matter though, does it? It's, it's the principle, the moral principle. Um, I think given the events of the weekend and the fact that uh, 200 uh, missiles and drones needed to be uh, dealt with um, sort of negated that argument. Okay, right. Uh, WhatsApp question from Graham in Chislehurst. It is... This, with another poll putting the Tories some 18 points behind Labour, is there any evidence that switching Sunak out for another leader could turn the tide for them? Now, the Savannah poll for the Telegraph has Labour on 45%, Conservatives 25 Lib Dems 10 Reform UK on 9 and the Greens on 4 That Reform UK number is interesting because the last poll, I don't know whether it was from them, but put them on 15 So um, the Conservatives would be very happy about that. Um, Henry? No. Um, just think about the process, right? Like, you'd have to have a challenge, the letters would go in, you'd have a contest, then presumably he loses, then you have the multi-rounds of MP voting, then you have a, the two of them go head-to-head -head the, uh, while the members vote. Far, right, right, but assuming, uh, this is it, right? We're talking about if you change the leader, you have to go through that entire, like, sausage-making machine of uh, absolute <laughs> horror. And then you have a new prime minister uh, who would ha ha have to go to the country almost immediately. Rishi Sunak has the ultimate job security, which is that he has a job that nobody wants. Everyone in the Tory party who wants to take over as Tory leader wants him to own the defeat and take over afterwards, right? That, that's why all of these plots... Are you sure about that? Because uh, if I was an aspirant Tory leader, might I not think four or five months as Prime Minister is better than no months as Prime Minister? Well, well, maybe there's another Liz Truss out there somewhere, you know, at least I got to be Prime Minister, but, like, no. There, you, you read the press reports, right? The press reports are like, oh, the One Nations group thinking about backing Pretty Patel, or the, the, the ERG is thinking about backing Penny Morden. That's Mad Libs. It, 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 it's just basically discontented people latching on to any possible potential. There's no one, right? Okay. And no one who's going to win. Angela? Everyone who's a bit cross with the Conservative Party at the moment is mostly cross because of this constant speculation over who's going to be leader and who's up and who's down. Um, I haven't actually seen any polling other than some slightly dodgy commission polling um, that says any other person in the Conservative Party uh, is more popular than the Prime Minister. Um, so I... I that, that in itself is quite worrying, I'd have thought. Um, no, no, but I just, I just think there's that this is a conversation that's not actually being had by real people out in the country. Um, it's the last thing that they want to see. I was um, the first MP to come out on Twitter and um, back Rishi um, uh, in the leadership. Um, I don't regret that at all. Um, he's had a really difficult set of circumstances that he inherited. But I would go further, and this is just me personally, um, I would say that in order to get a fair hearing from the country, um, we actually need to um, say sorry for a few things. And then I think we might get heard. Like but at the what? moment, yeah. um, I would specifically um, say sorry for all the um, psychodrama, as it's called, over the last few years. The changes in leader, I think it's very disruptive and unsettling for people. Um, after we've come out of COVID and we've been through so many difficult mm. things together, the cost of living, um, you know, things are improving, but I don't think we'll get a fair hearing on that uh, until um, we say sorry. And the reason we should do that is because we're in a relationship with the country. And if you're in a relationship, with somebody and you have um, done something to upset them and you've not mm. apologised, they're not going to listen to you. Um, so that's my strongly held view. Perhaps you should have given Liz Truss that advice before her round of interviews yesterday. <laughs> um, well, I was the fourth Conservative MP to say that her position was untenable um, and, you know, uh, she's You're a part fellow... Of the problem then. You, 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 you tried to get rid of her. Um, I think that it was in the country's best interest that Rishi Sunak came in and stabilised the economy with um, okay. Jeremy Hunt, and I don't regret that for one minute. Tessa. Are we still talking about the dead man walking, Rishi Sunak? 
I mean, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. He's a goner, and the quicker he pulls the trigger on the election, put us all out of our pain and misery, and just get on with it. But do you it think? Feels do like you a think? Boil that needs do you think if sort of Kemi Bazinok or Penny Mordaunt or someone came in and replaced no, him between now no, and then, it might save a few seats? It already feels dodgily undemocratic. I mean, this is the third. Is it the third prime minister we've had that we haven't elected? I can't remember how many. There's been such a revolving door. Um, the likes of Angela, your generation of MP that came in in 2019, you came in attached to Boris Johnson. I mean, you've had to do sort of three versions of um, a dressing up game and, and recast as somebody else entirely. So, no, it w would make absolutely no difference. And they just need to bite the bullet and get on okay. with the election. Claire. It made me think of that Father Ted thing. Is there anything to be said for another mass? Is there anything to be said for another leader? I think they're bonkers. And I think it's this, and I must say that was very sensible intervention from Angela. I almost feel sorry for Rishi Sunak, who is um, trying to keep the show on the road. And he is the Suella's here and the Liz is here coming out and saying things that are completely detached from the reality of people's lives. They deal in culture wars and factionalism yeah. and very little else and the election campaign. Right. Let's, let's, let's finish, like with, our, let's finish with our fun question, because I know... Henry has to go. It's from Jennifer in Southport. The boss of the fashion chain Superdry has hit back at people saying the struggling brand just isn't as cool as it used to be. What do you insist is still cool when everyone else has moved on from it? Angela. So I, I'm going to choose something that's popular now, but I think might have its day and I'll still be using it. And that's my air fryer. Um, I'm absolutely in love with it. I was a late adopter, but by God, it's changed my life. Um, and my daughter got me a Mother's Day card to say, I hope you love me as much as your air fryer. So I'm predicting the future here. Henry. Clubbing. Like very fewer and fewer people seem to do it. London's night club, the night economy has fallen off a cliff. Um, and indeed, a lot of people, when I go out, at least the nights I go to, are my age, which I think is a bad sign. Um, but nightclubbing, like once every two weeks, really regular, like you did in the noughties, that's what I think. Claire? I am. Um, um, I live with tweens and I'm in my 40s, so I'm acutely aware of how uncool I am, um, even though I still think I am. I think like a lot of people, I still listen to shamelessly to the music I did 25 years Quite ago right. so that mm. and actual books I'm always like carrying too many books and having to buy books when I should just clearly give it up and get a Kindle but I still think we should be married cool. Tessa <laughs> Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just going to get rid of that visual image. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just going to get myself cancelled here because I am a dyed in the wool feminist. I have an NDA to my name. I've called out several sex pests to my cost, but I have to admit when I had a man wolf whistle me this week, I, I felt flattered. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You've, your your feminist points you total is just on. dramatically <laughs> reduced. Podcast, now that'll be your next one. Right. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much indeed for coming in tonight. Tomorrow's panel includes the Labour MP Stella Creasy, the Liberal Democrat peer Lord Tim Razzle, and two other people who aren't on the list, so we'll find out who they are tomorrow. Laurie's currently on the phone. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, we are going to talk about praying next, believe it or not. It's 18 minutes past nine. This is LBC.
Promise. Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. I don't know about you, but I feel positively exhausted after that. Um, right, it was slightly later than we were planning to, for reasons if you were listening earlier, you will understand. We are going to move on to our nine o'clock phone-in, even though it's now 21 minutes past nine, but still lots of time to talk about the power of prayer. Because, um, and we're hooking this onto this news story that the Michaela School has uh, won, their, won the judgment in the High Court today, where 